thank you for your gifts. And thank you for your gift of lovely music, Renee. So Moses comes down from the mountain, eager to finally bring news and new teaching to his Israelites in the camp below. Yahweh, his God, gave him stone tablets engraved with the commandments that will bind these people and their God into covenant forever. Moses has been gone for 40 days and 40 nights, leaving his brother Aaron, the high priest of the Jews, in charge. We know the story. The camp had grown afraid and restless while Moses was away for so long, and they build an altar with a golden calf as an object for their worship. This violated the instructions left by Moses, but worshiping idols was their traditional way, and it brought them comfort. When Moses arrived and saw what had occurred, his anger flashed and he smashed the tablets inscribed by God because he felt his tribe was unworthy. The Israelites were shamed and punished for reverting to idolatry and worshiping idols instead of this one new God. And they were humble before Moses and God. They atoned for straying from the will and word of Yahweh. And after time passed, God did forgive them, restored their covenant, and gave Moses a second set of stone tablets with his commandments upon them. By Hebrew tradition, this was the first Yom Kippur, the first atonement by the Jewish people before God and each other. Now you probably know of Yom Kippur maybe best is the day where Jewish people don't show up at work and school. They fast for 25 hours and attend day long services at the temple. It is written in Torah that the days of awe, the 10 days from Rosh Hashanah should be celebrated and honored every autumn. And during this time, Jews are asked to repent their misdeeds from the previous year and to make amends and restitution. These mistakes can be those where they wronged other persons or where they violated the tenets of their faith. Their acts of contrition, apology, and restoration are seen as atonement for their wrong. An honorable repentance is hoped to bring each Jew a clean slate for the coming year, both in the eyes of their fellow congregants and in the eyes of their God. This is a far cry from how the word atonement is used in Christian theology. It is similar in the way that it describes a process by which one becomes reconciled with God. But in Christianity, a person does not engage in the process of atonement, except through becoming a believer. Atonement is gained from the sacrificial death of Christ. Jesus died for our sins, and it is through his crucifixion that the faithful can be reconciled with God. John Wesley wrote, nothing in the Christian system is of greater consequence than the doctrine of atonement. This forms the basis of how Christians see the world and live their faith. Atonement in Christianity addresses in addition, an original condition brought by every human that's premised on the understanding that we are born in a state of separation from God because we carry original sin and forms of innate depravity. It's interesting to see how theories of atonement have changed 
over time in Christian theology, how the narrative has been bent to public understanding to make sense of this crucial element of Christian belief. For the first thousand years of the church, most thinkers held that Satan was responsible for the fall of man, and the soul of perfectly innocent Jesus was given in payment for the return of humanity to God. In short, Jesus was paid his ransom to the devil. This made sense in a world that saw life as a war between good and evil, and where capture and ransom were routine aspects of normal life. By medieval times, ideas had changed, and the thought of an all-powerful God being in debt to the devil felt odd, if not absurd. Anselm offered that the problem was that God's honor was offended by human sin, but that humankind had no power to restore that hour, honor alone. But Jesus Christ, a man God, was unique. Fully human, he could atone for human sin. Fully God, he could restore honor to God. His sacrifice was essential to restoring the possibility of balance. This thinking was generated in feudal times, when everyone owed somebody something and order was maintained by systems of fine taxes and reparation. By the Protestant Reformation, the notice the belief. By the time of the Protestant Reformation, the notion of God having his honor offended by human sin shifted to a justice and power lens. John Calvin was perhaps the loudest proponent of the idea that God, being the ultimate judge in the universe, just could not allow human sin to go unpunished. Christ's sacrifice fulfills God's demand for justice. Jesus was sent by God to satisfy justice, and he willingly and lovingly offered himself to take the place of sinners, namely us. And this remains the dominant view among Christian evangelicals even today. And other new theories continue to develop other new narratives, I will mention one, the moral influence theory. In this line of Christian thought, Christ's life, death, and resurrection are exemplars. They show us the true nature of love and help us turn back to God. The meaning of the cross in this vein is to pull us in and encourage us to atone for ourselves. There is no transaction required by God here. Jesus is held as an example of the best of humanity and not as the bearer of our worst. I think this idea would play in most Unitarian Universalist congregations. But even as these ideas of atonement become softer and gentler in form, they all assume that humans are born with original sin and that we require some type of salvation to become worthy of God. Also, all Christian atonement can be accomplished only through faith and the acceptance of Jesus as a savior. Any idea of salvation through works, doing good things rather than salvation through faith is still considered heretical in most Christian professions. In English, atonement literally means to become at one with oneself and potentially with one's God. How many words have the definition built into the word? At one, atone. It entails pieces of remorse, repentance, guilt, sorrow, reconciliation, reparation, and forgiveness. 
Atonement is a way of correcting wrongdoing and attempting to find redemption in our lives. What the Jews do every year during the High Holy Days is consistent with the way I understand atonement. Every day between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the people make their peace with anyone they have wronged or slighted or injured in any way or in any way neglected during the past 12 months. The task is not so much to patch things up or smooth things over or reach a compromise or sweep mistakes under the rug. The task is not to feel better. The task is ownership. The goal is truth for its own redemptive sake. I did this. I said this to you, and I was wrong. I neglected this. I botched this. I betrayed you thusly. I demeaned you, whether you even knew it or not. This is the truth in which both of us are living. I ask you to forgive me. Whether they do forgive you is another matter. What is important is that you owned your errors. I can value this annual exercise in self-examination, engagement, and restorative practice. It's a deep and introspective approach to cleaning the slate. And if done following the teachings, it must be very humbling indeed. It's definitely of a higher moral order than our standard New Year's resolutions, which address pragmatic in-your-face problems like getting more exercise, losing weight, saving money, and pursuing career ambitions. Those were the top four ranked resolutions during some recent year. It's the positive outcome that can be gained from taking responsibility for our shortcoming and attempting to restore harmony in our relationships. This tradition builds community. It reinforces moral sensibility and gives persons a path to restore and build their sense of personal worth and honor. And it's not that Christians can't do similar things in their own lives. Indeed, addressing one's missteps would be encouraged in any circle, but it's given far less priority and emphasis than holding a personal faith commitment to God and the church. Even the Catholic acts of confession are directed only to God through the priest. The underlying principle in atonement is finding or restoring harmony and establishing a personal orientation in a way of being that feels just, right, and fulfilling. We might feel the need to atone to God, and we might feel the need to atone with other persons. But in some ways, I believe that is most important that we find a way to atone with ourselves, to become at one and work towards bringing our lives into balance and harmony with our own deepest ideals and interests. It may be atoning to those outside ourselves is a necessary first step. We all know that it is difficult to find peace and calm while navigating in troubled waters. But I believe that coming to terms with ourselves, with our own needs, desires, and fears, that is the essential task that rests before each of us. Religions tended to externalize the process and build it into ritual practice. The Christians rely on faith and salvation. The Jews on obedience and pleasing God the Muslims on submission to the will of God, the Buddhists on the mitigation of pain and suffering. These pursuits have helped to focus people, to put them on life paths that encourage prayer, devotion, and attention to their actions. The positive side of religious practice 
has been to lead adherence into a space where introspection and self-contemplation make sense. Our Unitarian Universalist traditions long ago rejected the Christian beliefs in gaining salvation and atonement through the crucifixion of Jesus. The Universalists began on the premise of universal salvation, which rendered the need for salvation through God unnecessary. And the early, Christ, and the early Unitarians rejected the idea that Christ was part of the divine. So a mechanism of salvation through his death on the cross, as tragic as it might be, bears no potential to absolve us of any evils. So without such religious guidance, should you use concern themselves with atonement? Should you worry about reconciliation with those around you? Should you own your shortcomings and do the difficult work of apologizing and maybe making restitution for harms you have brought? Should you work to repair your own life so that you are comfortable and proud of the person you are? Well, this is easy. The answer is yes, yes, and yes. Whatever sources you rely on in finding your personal values and understandings, the importance of caring and compassion and personal responsibility must remain central to all endeavors, as must living graciously in our families and communities. We all come up short of the mark sometimes, probably too much of the time. But the lesson of atonement is that we can find redemption. We can all make corrections. Whatever we were or did yesterday, we still have the capability to try to be and do better today and tomorrow. You don't need religion to find a moral path through life. And religious practices are only a crutch in accomplishing a gracious lifetime. We alone can make the decisions that help bring us to a path of graciousness, to a state where we truly feel at one with ourselves and our lives. We are free to adopt and refine practices from all religions and encourage ourselves to gain wisdom from many sources, including other faith traditions. I believe we could all benefit from building some semblance of Yom Kippur practice into our own lives. It doesn't have to be a public holiday, and you probably don't have to fast, but a process of self-questioning, becoming present to our shortcomings, and striving to acknowledge and repair wrong, this would help lead, lead us each towards the good, the sacred, the holy, however we view them. One of the hardest things for many of us to do is to admit error and say, I was wrong, I am sorry. We can't control how these words are received, but when they are accepted gracefully, they can be among the most powerful words we know. This is true when we say them to others, and this is true when we say them to ourselves. So be it, amen, ashe, and blessed be.